This meeting is being recorded. Okay, go for it. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor, uh, Professor Rajesh uh, Gopakumar, uh, who, besides being an accomplished uh, scientist, uh, uh, has been a long time friend and well wisher. Uh, did his integrated master's uh, uh, in physics, physics uh, from IIT Kanpur, and uh, subsequently he did his uh, PhD at Princeton University. Uh, after being a research associate at uh, Harvard University, uh, he moved to the Harish Chandra Research Institute in 2001 as associate professor uh, and then uh, was promoted to professorship there. Uh, he was also a long term uh, uh, visiting member at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton from 2001 to 2004. He is presently the director of uh, the International Center for Theoretical Studies in Bangalore. Uh, Rajesh uh, is a recipient of uh, several awards, uh, including the CTP Prize in honor of uh, GC Vic in 2006, uh, the Bhatnagar Award in 2009, the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship in 2006, JC Bose Fellowship in 2015, and the GD Birla Prize in 2013. Uh, he also won the Third World Academy of Sciences Prize in Physical Sciences in 2013. He's a fellow of all, all the three academies in India, the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy, and the National Academy of Sciences India. He was also elected as a fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences in 2015. He is a founding member, uh, now alumnus of the Global Young Academy, GUIA. Today, uh, Rajesh will be speaking about deriving uh, gauge string duality, uh, Rajesh. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sridhar, for the, the introduction. And uh, thank you to Mukund and uh, uh, Madhav and, uh, and uh, everyone else uh, for the invitation to speak at this event. I'm very happy uh, about this FC Kohli Center coming up uh, at CMI and my best wishes and uh, whatever support I can give uh, for the endeavor. I think India needs uh, many such uh, centers and program events to bring our communities in various uh, mathematics, theoretical physics, uh, other such areas together. And uh, I'm sure uh, the FC Kohli Center will blaze a great path uh, ahead. Uh, so uh, uh, so let me share my screen first. Um, okay, and, uh, okay, so I hope the screen is visible and it's all right. Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I will be talking about this um, very uh, uh, important uh, central topic of theoretical physics called gate string duality I'll, uh, and uh, uh, but uh, more specifically about uh, uh, a long term uh, program uh, to in some sense uh, derive it from uh, more uh, basic principles uh, so let me uh, try to explain. Um, uh, so the roadmap of the stock is roughly as follows. I'll first try to give uh, uh, a little bit of a quick introduction to what gate string duality is, and uh, in particular, why it is so important, uh, why I claim that it's a very central uh, 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 topic. And then, as I said, I will talk of a sort of a sketch of a program uh, this is a sort of a nod, and uh, especially mathematicians at uh, CMI will uh, probably um, appreciate the nod to uh, Grothendieck's uh, a sketch of a program, uh, which uh, actually it's not the kind of just a, um, a, a gratuitous nod. It's uh, there is a, something that I actually won't have time to talk about today, except maybe perhaps mention tangentially. But in some sense, some aspects have to do with uh, the the Saint the Enfant uh, program of uh, Got uh, Grothendieck, uh, and um, so in any case, uh, the broad uh, thrust here will be uh, attempt to go from sort of world lines which characterize particles or field theories uh, more generally uh, to world sheets which characterize strings. 
And um, so I will uh, try to uh, convey how this is the central core of uh, a program to try to understand this gate string duality in some fundamental way. And uh, I will exhibit as a proof of concept of this um, two particular cases of the ADS safety correspondence to fairly important central uh, cases of the instances of the ADS safety correspondence uh, in a very special limit, which I'll call the tensionless limit of this uh, string. I'll explain that. And I'll explain how one can, in these cases, uh, uh, go from strings to fields and uh, sort of go from fields to strings using this sort of ideas that I, I would have sketched in the first half and then very brief outlook. So that's the roadmap. So first, some very general comments, since uh, perhaps uh, this is a, a slightly general audience. Um, uh, so uh, this is maybe superfluous for many of you, but uh, quantum field theory uh, or QFT uh, uh, to abbreviate and general relativity are mainstays of, have been the mainstays of 20th century theoretical physics uh, because they are very broad frameworks as opposed to individual theories. These are broad theoretical frameworks that between the two of them, in a sense, describe the better part of our universe. Quantum field theory is a framework which, in a sense, is a culmination of quantum mechanics. In some sense, it is the unification of the wave and particle notion in, in its most complete fashion. And uh, that quantum field theory framework has proven over the course of the 20th century to be amazingly powerful, not only in describing as it started out in the beginning to describe quantum electrodynamics or Maxwell's electrodynamics at the quantum level, but it went on to describe all the non-gravity capture, all the non-gravitational forces, namely the strong interactions and the weak interactions, and in fact, the combined electroweak interactions uh, at the quantum level. And uh, in fact, in, these are all instances of a very specific class of quantum field theories called Young-Mills gauge theories, which uh, I think are familiar now to mathematicians as well as uh, uh, physicists. This and uh, these, uh, uh, but quantum field theories in general are not only uh, those, uh, the framework has not only been used to describe um, uh, the fundamental interactions at the quantum level, it's a very versatile framework which has also enables one to capture complex phenomena uh, of multiple degrees of freedom interacting with nature uh, and also capture the different phases in which matter can exist and uh, and this has been of great importance in uh, not only in particle physics and related areas therefore but also in statistical physics condensed matter physics and now uh, actually even being applied to fluid dynamics and uh, uh, even the mathematics of finance because in some sense uh, quantum field theory uh, the quantum fluctuations and statistical fluctuations are very similar to each other at the mathematical level and so the same framework is very versatile and can capture this as was first appreciated by Ken Wilson, uh, who also emphasized the notion of um, what are called fixed points of the quantum field theories, which turn out to be special. And I will talk about them um, very much in this talk. These are the so-called conformal field theories. But anyhow, uh, Quantum field theory is this very uh, powerful framework. GR, on the other hand, general relativity is uh, is a classical description of nature, and it's more or less it is a, it's a very beautiful geometric description of the force of gravity by giving the space-time geometry a dynamical sort of uh, existence, uh, sh uh, showing that uh, space-time geometry is dynamic and governed by these Einstein equations, which are very complex generalizations of Maxwell's equations, nonlinear equations. And, and this is also a very successful description. It is by far the best for the describing the cosmos at the largest scales and it continues to be a very good description all the way, very close to the Big Bang, as we now have experimental signatures of. So, 
Now, so string theory. Uh, so string theory is also a framework. I think we understand it more and uh, more and more now as a framework, a rather ambitious framework, which generalizes quantum field theory in many ways uh, to be able to describe gravitational interactions at the quantum level. So I didn't mention this, but quantum field theory, powerful as it is, uh, could not ca somehow capture the um, fluctuations of the space-time geometry itself, because in some sense, quantum field theory uh, implicitly assumes a fixed space-time on which the other, other fields can sort of fluctuate. But to have the space-time itself fluctuating is not something quantum field theory has been successfully able to, uh, uh, to capture. Uh, and uh, string theory appears to be able to overcome that limitation. Uh, and it exploits the fact that um, if you just take a single relativistic string, um, a string moving according to the laws of special relativity, uh, that contains the graviton, uh, which is a sort of a tensor field, uh, as one of its uh, two, uh, one of its lowest modes of excitation, which is quite remarkable. And uh, uh, if you then generalize the recipes of quantum field theory, which describe, uh, at least in uh, when the fields are weakly interacting, they describe, the, uh, the interactions are described by these Feynman diagrams that uh, I'm sure people have seen. It uh, The string theory, these diagrams or world lines uh, of these particles, and uh, that's what the Feynman diagrams in a sense represent, uh, are replaced uh, by world sheets because you now have a string-like object which is now tracing out a two-dimensional surface and it happens to be actually a Riemann surface uh, has a very naturally a complex um, uh, nature to it. Uh, and this um, uh, uh, world sheet description uh, gives you a consistent description of quantum corrections to Einstein's equations as well. So this was uh, been known for a while, and that was part of the reason why string theory was very compelling. But that's not what I will be really talking about. I mean, not this uh, um, aspect of string theory, but something that has uh, in the last quarter, 25 years or so, been one of the major themes of string theory, this so-called gate string duality. So what is it, just in brief, again, perhaps you might have heard uh, some talks and, and sometimes by, maybe even by me uh, earlier, but uh, uh, this is a, some, is a, it came as a very unexpected equivalence. It's an equivalence between two categories, so to say, to use that language, uh, be, between uh, the category of string theories or quantum gravity uh, on a certain class of space times and uh, gauge theories or these Yang Mills theories that I said uh, on their conformal boundary. Now, the space times uh, that uh, when I say certain space times, what I have in mind are essentially hyperbolic space times, space times with a negative curvature. And these are in the physics language or rather in the Lorentzian signature where you have a time and the space um, uh, ha having opposite signatures. It's what is called antidecitor space, but it's essentially an analytic continuation of hyperbolic space. Um, and these space times are asymptotically antidecitor. So uh, antidecitor space, of course, hyperbolic space, many of you have seen these Escher images of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the constant negative curvature spaces. Now you have a time direction as well. So topologically, it's a bit like a cross section, which is a constant negative curvature together with time. And they're kind of folded in in such a way that the full geometry is also has a negative curvature. Uh, and uh, But the important point to note is if you think of the topology uh, the conformal topology, uh, I mean, the topology of this um, uh, space time as a, like a cylinder effectively, then there's a boundary of the cylinder. The solid cylinder is the antidecitor space time, and the boundary of the cylinder is one lower dimensional. And that's what will be important um, because the quantum field theories. 
live on this so-called conformal boundary and because of the sort of conformal invariance uh, of this um, because the boundary metric is defined only up to an overall scale factor uh, the well-defined quantum field theories here are actually conformal field theories so it's an equivalence between string theories in this antidecitor space-time and gauge theories on the one lower dimensional conformal boundary of that space-time that's in short what this equivalence is and um, uh, and there are many elements in this equivalence uh, uh, there's a whole dictionary which uh, allows you to translate between the bulk as it is called that's the whole interior of the antidecitor space-time and the boundary uh, conformal field theory so you have a dictionary between these two the conformal field theory in d dimensions and the antidecitor space-time in d plus one uh, space-time dimensions. And this dictionary enables you to translate questions in quantum field theory uh, or in the quantum field theory or the conformal field theory on the boundary to a string theory or gravity in the interior. And I'll try to bring out why this is so remarkable. But at this stage, I want to mention uh, further that it's not just any old equivalent. This equivalence goes in a very specific way, and I'll mention uh, a little more about the precise dictionary a little later, but um, effectively a weakly curved antidecitor spacetime, meaning if the radius of curvature uh, or the curvature itself is very small, the radius of curvature is very large. Uh, so a very weakly curved antidecitor spacetime is mapped to a strongly coupled or strongly interacting quantum field theory and vice versa, a highly curved antidecitor spacetime, uh, the radius is very small, uh, that corresponds to a weakly interacting or a weakly coupled uh, quantum field theory in the language of physicists. And this is what makes it a very a real duality because you can imagine that a weakly curved space-time is much more easy to describe because the curvature is small. And in fact, it is described by Einstein's theory plus perhaps corrections. Um, and that is telling you something about a very strongly interacting quantum field theory. Whereas in the other way around a very highly curved antidecitor space-time, which you actually know very little about its properties when the curvatures are very high, very large in some units, uh, and then uh, the, that corresponds to something you understand fairly well where the, in the quantum field theory is weakly coupled or not very strongly interacting. And this uh, it's this uh, remarkable duality, which uh, originally was uh, proposed by uh, the Argentinian physicist Juan Maldacena, uh, that uh, makes it so remarkable. So in fact, let me elaborate a bit on why is this such a big deal. Uh, so uh, from the GR side, uh, it's remarkable from both sides, whichever side you come to it, if you are a practicing gravitational physicist who didn't care about quantum field theory, you would find it quite amazing. If you were a quantum field theorist who didn't uh, need uh, to think about Einstein's theory in, in your, um, as your bread and butter, you, you realize that uh, uh, you, you had a totally new window. Uh, so from both sides, it's remarkable. From the GR side, what it does is it gives you a concrete model for what a quantum gravity description can really look like, uh, and as at least for this class of spacetimes, which is a very large class of spacetimes, uh, these asymptotically antidecitor spacetimes, and it realizes an idea that predates this duality called the holography. I alluded to this earlier that it's a relation which claims that the microscopic degrees of freedom of a quantum gravity system are actually fewer or thinner than one might naively expect. They are actually captured in a, uh, the, the dynamics is capturable in a holographic screen, if you wish, and in this case at the boundary. And this description is uh, moreover here 
this was a sort of a very abstract idea. I mean, a very general speculation in some ways by uh, Toft and Suskind based on the nature of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of black holes. Uh, but this uh, proposal, the ADS, the gate string duality or ADS CFT, as I will call it for short, um, uh, this realizes this idea in a very concrete way and tells you what these microscopic degrees of freedom in this quantum gravity description are. They are the microscopic degrees of freedom of a quantum field theory, but in one lower dimension, the one that lives on this conformal boundary. Uh, so that's uh, very remarkable from a quantum gravity viewpoint, and it has been uh, therefore uh, uh, explored a lot and there's a lot to be said there and I prob I won't be able to say too much um, in this talk. But from the quantum field theory side, it's also remarkable because it gives a completely unsuspected dual description of very strongly interacting gauge theories which you actually have very little access to. Quantum field theory, as you find it in textbooks, is mostly about weakly interacting gauge theories. When the field theories are uh, weakly interacting, like that happens in electrodynamics, the fine structure constant in nature is very small, 1 over 137 approximately. And so you can do a sort of a perturbation expansion in that parameter. And that is remarkably uh, successful uh, in capturing the leading quantum effects. And that's what uh, the theory QED and its successes are all about. And the Feynman diagram prescription is uh, part and parcel of that uh, prescript uh, perturbative description that you learn in textbooks. But strongly interacting quantum field theories uh, are much more difficult to, to quantitatively tackle. And this gives a, just a just a, a mind-blowingly different description of the strongly coupled theories in the sense that it tells you you solve classical Einstein equations, which seem to have nothing to do with the quantum field theory you're studying, uh, typically Young-Mills uh, gauge theories. The uh, claim is you solve Einstein equations and you learn about a highly quantum, this ultra strongly interacting regime of a gauge theory. So that's been very remarkable and very powerful and borne out in multiple ways in these last 25 years. It's also remarkable from a conceptual point of view in some sense that it realizes a very old idea whose lineage can be traced back to Faraday and Maxwell actually, that the flux lines of gauge theories like in electrodynamics, of course, uh, Maxwell and Faraday were thinking of the lines of force, uh, uh, which are really in some sense uh, flux lines of the electric and magnetic fields. But uh, they, in fact, Maxwell arrived at his equations by first trying to make sense of equations for these lines of force, which he thought of as like thin vortices and he uh, are string-like objects actually, and tried to write equations for them, but didn't succeed. And finally he, after a long struggle of several years, arrived at what we now know as the Maxwell equations. Uh, and in fact, this idea uh, was something that Dirac himself uh, tried to revisit and he thought of the, flux tubes again as the basic entities and more concretely in recent years in Toft's particular so-called large n limit. Um, so it realizes this old idea, which is actually very useful for describing precisely strongly interacting theories and Toft in particular introduced this as a way to understand QCD, the study of the strong interactions, uh, the uh, quantum chromodynamics. So it realizes these ideas in some very precise way, uh, but yet we don't have it in all generality. And that's part of the reason I am giving this talk. But again, for some of the mathematicians here, I, I want to make a comparison that in some sense, in uh, uh, in flavor, in the flavor of uh, connecting these very uh, different subjects, its scope in the breadth of the um, uh, connections, and in some ways, just the sheer grandeur of the um, uh, connection. It's very comparable, I feel, to the Langlands correspondence, and uh, quite. Uh, and it's something you feel you are only seeing a small tip of the iceberg. So very naturally, this has had a 
major impact in many areas of theoretical physics and also maths, though, in a less uh, impactful way. Um, it's uh, been in some ways an engine of progress in several areas. And this may make sense many, mainly to some of the physicists here. If, uh, if the names don't make any sense, don't worry, just to give you a idea of the breadth of the topics in high energy physics, the so-called Randall syndrome scenario for um, uh, beyond the standard model in the study of scattering amplitudes through these uh, um, uh, and, and novel properties of them through in QCD as sort of a phenomenological kind of a description of QCD in the attempts like ADS QCD and also to study something a very new exotic phase of matter that has been found in accelerators called quark gluon plasma and its properties in particular its viscosity and so on have uh, helped in um, ADS safety has given new insights into these, similarly in cosmology and uh, condensed matter physics and also quantum information. So these are all topics, each of them could be multiple talks, uh, but I uh, just wanted to list them out here. So what I'm going to talk about is, as I said, an, a way to an approach to deriving this duality. Now, I approach it as a physicist, and so my concern uh, is not mathematical fastidiousness. It's, it's driven by a physics necessity, I feel, because we understand corners of this duality. It's largely miraculous for any practitioner at this stage, but in a sense, I think as scientists, our job is to sort of demystify miracles. And um, so you want to sort of uh, uncover the cogs and wheels which make this duality really tick, uh, the kind of nuts and bolts of it. And so that's where I come from uh, in this. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so when I say derive, it's at a physicist level of derivation or proving, and you should not view this as a sort of a mathematical exercise. Um, um, so, uh, but the, the, what is the physics necessities in some ways? Uh, uh, why is the current state of affairs unsatisfactory in some sense? The uh, thing is that we understand, as I said, only certain corners, which I have to do, which I'll make a little more pictorial in the next slide or so. Um, but um, the corner we are looking at is effectively where Einstein's theory is the dual this is the is a good description but if you go beyond that to what you might call the stringy regime of ads cft this is largely unexplored territory and um, specifically talking when the couplings are of order one the curvatures are of order one they're not very weakly curved neither are they very strongly curved and so on uh, and uh, uh, but you and you can work in such a regime and keep the strings still semi classical by taking a particular limit, the so called large end limit, which I'll just mention. Um, uh, and so, this is a regime which is very interesting because in most uh, systems, the couplings are not very, very large or very, very small, but they are often of order one. So that's a regime you want to understand and this, get the stringy nature of this correspondence out, which you still really don't uh, access so well right now. And as I mentioned earlier, in the context of Maxwell, Dirac, and uh, the QCD in particular, these dual stringy descriptions are likely to be ubiquitous in the sense that physical systems like QCD or strongly correlated systems in condensed matter physics are uh, things you would like to get a different a way to get a handle on them. And this dual stringy description is like is uh, is likely to do that. And in and in this uh, uh, the original paradigm of Toft, uh, where he considered UN gauge theories, Yang Mills gauge theories with gauge group UN, in which you take N very large. And he realized that that's a simplifying limit. And that's in some sense, this large N limit that we will see here and in the next slide and so on, that that limit uh, gives the right starting point. And in fact, in even in a theory like QCD, uh, which is described by a SU3 gauge theory, uh, even though N is three, that's still a good starting point and gives a very good 
approximation uh, to uh, to QCD, which you don't otherwise have. So that's another reason. And more generally, I think this idea that quantum field theories can reassemble themselves into string theories is, I think, very fascinating to me. And it's, I, as I said earlier, it's this goes back to Maxwell and Faraday, this idea of how you can describe some um, nature by sometimes fields or by extended string-like or vortex-like excitations. And this uh, understanding the nuts and bolts of how quantum field theories reassemble themselves into string theories it will enable you to delineate the scope of such uh, gauge string dualities. In some sense, we know it's the equivalence of these two categories, like I said, but we don't know the boundaries of that to these categories very sharply. And we have many, many examples. A lot of them are supersymmetric examples, though there are non-supersymmetric ones as well, but we don't still know that sort of space of, uh, and many examples is not enough to get a conceptual uh, understanding. So from the point of view of the gravity theory or the quantum gravity theory, this holography that I mentioned is very mysterious because Einstein's theory appears to be a local theory in the antidecitta space-time uh, or any space-time, uh, but somehow the idea that the quantum description of gravity is very different from other quantum descriptions of other forces and has this reduction of the number of degrees of freedom uh, such that it's sort of effectively that of one lower dimension, that sort of a remarkable uh, fact and uh, this uh, sort of dictionary I think is important to understand and again whether it extends beyond antidecitta space to flat space. Flat space it kind of you can almost take a limit of antidecitta space to reach flat space but the question of something like decitta space which our universe actually is with a pos positive cosmological constant is whether there's a notion of holography at the quantum level there is another important question i think we will not make headway into these questions unless we really decipher this duality so that's the motivation so this is the phase diagram i was saying a bit earlier you can distill the sort of parameter space into a two-dimensional plane uh, and the vertical and the horizontal axes have meanings at both uh, from both the gravity side as well as I mean the string theory side as well as from the quantum field theory side. Let me first start with the quantum field theory side. There is this parameter n, which as I said, it's the rank of the gauge group or so on, and you typically take that very large. So if you plot one over n and this axis, you're really, the, you're usually will be working and that's what I'll mostly be doing in this one over n expansion or effectively or expanding around very large n. And, uh, and so you're, effectively below this dashed line, so, so to say. This region is what's called quantum string theory and tackling that is a further challenge. But even within here, the, the challenges are considerable. So I'll focus on, so this axis on the, from the gravity side, this one over N corresponds to the strength of the string interactions. And so we are looking at, so to say, weakly interacting strings, not the same as weakly interacting fields. So the weakly interacting string axis is this one where you increase the string coupling. So everything here is weakly interacting, but the and the field theory interaction parameter is what we have plotted on the horizontal axis. So that independently of the string interaction parameter can again go from sort of zero to infinity. So this lambda refers to the uh, interaction parameter of the, uh, of the uh, field theory. And that translates into effectively the radius of the ADS. The radius is uh, the inverse of the, it's a measure of the inverse of the curvature. So when this uh, radius is small as uh, the coupling of is weak, that corresponds to this perturbative regime in the quantum field theory because the coupling is weak, but it's a very highly curved regime because the radius is very small. So it's highly curved regime from the string theory point of view. That's what I mentioned earlier. Um, if you take the coupling on the other hand very large, 
that's when the radius becomes very large as well. And um, so the uh, space-time is very weakly coupled and you can use a classical Einstein gravity description. So these are the two corners which are in some sense accessible. And this gravity is description is what I mentioned earlier that you solve Einstein's equations to learn about extremely strong couple, strong coupling limits. So this is the opposite. This is where lambda is going to infinity in some sense. The ultra strong uh, coupling regime of the field theory, that's this corner. And in fact, most of the work in the ADS-CFT has largely been around this part of the lamppost. Um, uh, and uh, you, you have a very uh, weakly curved ADS and you can cor correct Einstein's theory systematically. String theory tells you how to get systematic higher derivative corrections. And that, that's been the corner that's been mostly explored. Uh, 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 the part of, of the diagram I've been emphasizing is to go away from here or all, all the way here and even find out the dual. And what I would in fact want to say now is that we should be looking at this regime, which we understand from the field theory because it's the perturbative regime, but we don't understand it very well from the bulk point of view, from the string theory or the gravity point of view. And so that's the regime we should be looking at, the highly curved or uh, from the point of view of the string theory, it's what is called the tensionless limit because the dimensionless ratio of is of the so-called string length with the uh, antidiscitor radius. And when this parameter goes to zero, you can think of that as effectively the string tension, uh, which is the inverse of the string length parameter that appears here going to uh, zero. In fact, the dictionary is uh, like I wrote over here, the radius the, of the ADS is some positive power of the uh, coupling constant of the gauge theory. And then this is the relation between the the string interaction parameter and one over n the, uh, uh, of the gauge theory. Okay, so let me give an operational definition of what it means to derive the duality. Uh, so uh, a large part of the dictionary, and now it is a little bit, uh, get a little technical, but a large part of the dictionary is about the equality of what are called correlators in the two sides of the duality. And uh, um, uh, sort of a schematic mathematical equality of the uh, two uh, sides is the following that you consider a class of what are called gauge invariant uh, operators in your uh, quantum field theory. These are these things called O's. Um, they have various labels, you can ignore them, but the X's refer to the space-time position and they're on this conformal boundary. And I look in the Euclidean signature where the space-time is really a hyperbolic space-time and the conformal boundary of the hyperbolic space-time is the, of the D plus one dimensional hyperbolic space-time is the D-dimensional sphere. So uh, you can think of it as the Euclidean version of what I have discussed. Mm, the positions are all uh, points on the sphere and uh, there are some other labels, as I said. And on this side, that's a correlation function you compute the so-called correlator of these operators, an endpoint correlator with a little n um, uh, on the sphere, and you pick out the piece of this correlator which goes in the large n expansion as this power of n. That's with the, what is called the genus expansion of the, the Toft genus expansion of correlators. This was the large n limit as Toft described it, how you can systematically extract out pieces and they are very naturally associated with a genus. And this is the genus of the dual string theory, a Riemann surface of the world sheet of the string theory. And that's what appears here on the right hand side that uh, for a given G, what you have is a correlator on the string theory and the string theory correlators are given in terms of some two dimensional uh, world sheet theory which uh, has, and they, these are operators in that theory, uh, and they are labeled by uh, the space-time positions of the corresponding operators in the field theory. 
together with positions on the Riemann surface. Um, and in fact, you should think of this, uh, the, uh, uh, these positions as being points on the modelized space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with N punctures. And these are the N punctures uh, here. So you have a Riemann surface with N punctures uh, that corresponds to this N point correlator. And you define a certain quantity, which turns out to be this correlator is a natural form that you can integrate over this modelized space. And uh, this is the object that is supposed to be the same as uh, this dual field theory correlator. And you can see that these are very different objects. This is true for, uh, this is supposed to be true in all generality uh, as uh, for every G, for every N, for all Xs and so on, for all of these labels, Ws and Hs and so on. Uh, so it's a very powerful statement and it's a large part of the dictionary between the two sides. Uh, and uh, of course, when I say this, I presuppose that there is a firstly a one-to-one -one correspondence between individual operators here and individual, um, so to say, operators, uh, vertex operators, as they're called in the field, in the string theory. And this correspondence is, in a sense, the first step. It's what is called the matching of the spectrum of the theory or the states. These generate the basic states of the CFT, and these generate the basic states of the spectrum of states of the uh, string theory. And so uh, uh, once you have this correspondence, then you can talk about the general uh, N case. Um, and I want to stress that both sides are autonomously well-defined, in some sense, mathematically uh, reasonably well-defined. The left-hand side is a quantum field theory uh, at its fixed point. Uh, this conformal field theory can be, in principle, put on a lattice and made well-defined. Uh, the right-hand side, similarly, is defined in terms of a two-dimensional conformal field theory, which is the world sheet CFT. And, uh, uh, and this, again, uh, and then uh, some some natural integrand uh, top form on the modelized space. So it's a mathematically well-posed question to ask about the equality of these two correlators. The point is to try to make that equality manifest. That's what I feel constitutes a derivation or at least a useful derivation, a way to kind of, so to say, tautologize this correspondence. Um, so the um, uh, so what uh, what I am advocating is that we start with the weak coupling limit, as I said in that diagram, and we start with the left hand side and reconstruct the right hand side. And uh, there's a way to uh, kind of a procedure that I'll outline to do that. But firstly, let me say why it's a good idea to start with this weak coupling limit, apart from it being uh, the part where you understand the field theory better. From the string theory side as well, it's believed that this tensionless limit has a very large unbroken symmetry, which involves higher spin fields and so on. It's perhaps related to a topological phase of gravity. And the when you have a tension that's like Higgsing a symmetry, if you're familiar with that language. Uh, when uh, gauge symmetry is Higgs, then objects get masses. And uh, the, ten the string is believed to get a tension here, in a sense, through a similar Higgsing mechanism. So this uh, limit is a good starting point to expand around. And lest you think that uh, it's very boring, that's after all perturbative quantum field theories, I, I just want to make a comment here that the many mysteries in perturbative Yang Mills itself has shown it has a lot of structures we have been uncovering in scattering amplitudes. Uh, uh, Alok and others at uh, CMI have been working on uh, related uh, math, uh, structures. And there are other structures in the Feynman integrals that even mathematicians have been studying. There's the integrability of the uh, perturbative expansion. Um, and the, there are un, uh, hidden and symmetries, etc. So it's a, uh, it's very. Uh, so I think it's a very rich uh, uh, domain, a rich regime to sort of expand around, and uh, we are bound to learn many interesting things. But what's the basic idea behind 
connecting these two by starting from here and trying to reconstruct this. So the basic idea is to sum over the distinct world line topologies of Feynman diagrams, because this side we can now discuss in terms of Feynman diagrams since the coupling is weak uh, for a large end theory and show that in some sense, and the sum over these world lines actually goes over very naturally to a sum over distinct world sheets, which is what you are integrating over when you say this modelized space. And that happens after sort of gluing up these double line uh, Feynman diagrams, which are well, introduced by Toft in describing the large end limit. So, uh, so uh, Toft described Feynman diagrams of a large end theory in terms of sort of these uh, ribbon graphs. And if you wish, the slogan here is that you have a sum over all these Feynman graphs that somehow has to become a sum or an integral over these world sheets. But it's a, a claim I'm making here is a stronger one that each Feynman graph corresponds to a point on the modelized space of the um, uh, string theory, a point on the modelized space of the Riemann surface uh, on which the string theory lives. Uh, and uh, this exploits a very beautiful parameterization of the modelized space of Riemann surfaces uh, due to the mathematician Strebel, which has been uh, used in the mathematics literature also. Uh, but it's exactly what one needs uh, to actually implement this uh, connection. And um, uh, so it it, it implements what in physics language is believed to be the physical reason and the original motivation for Maldesena to propose this as so-called open closed string duality, where you think of gluing these ribbon graphs, uh, which you think of as open strings of these sort of um, world sheets with boundaries. And then you somehow are gluing them to form world sheets without, uh, which are kind of closed string world sheets. So these are like, uh, if you wish, uh, ribbons propagating in time, but these are more like rubber bands propagating in time. Uh, so that's the open closed duality. This association of uh, Feynman graphs with closed string world sheets is a refinement of this Toft idea of associating a genus to um, uh, Feynman graphs of uh, or amplitudes of a uh, uh, large end theory. In particular, we are now claiming that not, it's not only a, that says a genus, but there's actually to each Feynman diagram, there's a, there is a particular point on this modelized space. And so in a picture, another pictorial way to represent this uh, is these are the ribbon graphs. And you should imagine a case uh, when there are many of them, actually, that's uh, when there are many of these so-called Feynman Wick contractions uh, in between the different. So that I'm, uh, I have three points here, and there's a point at infinity as well, where all these are going. And any line which is not contracted is contracting to the point at infinity. And you can think of each of these as sort of these strips that I had in this. Uh, previous uh, picture, these strips. And uh, these strips are uh, effectively conformally mapped to these quadrilaterals here. Uh, and you're gluing them. And this procedure, this gluing them is happens through this Strebel procedure, which I'll just mention very briefly, which gives the so-called Strebel surface, which is a very special foliation of a Riemann surface, which enables you to parameterize the modelized space of Riemann surfaces. So that you can see that the original Feynman graphs, or it's rather the skeleton of that Feynman graph, is what we have here in bold. And there's a dual graph, which will be important, uh, which is what is marked here in the color, this thing. And uh, these, in fact, these crosses will be, as I will describe again here, uh, so this is the, another picture more crudely drawn. But let me say a little bit about what these trouble differentials are. They foliate this Riemann surface into what are called horizontal trajectories. And, uh, and these uh, carve out a kind of disk-like domains, uh, each of which contains a double pole of this treble differential. Uh, and, uh, and these domains are separated by this critical graph, which is the one that's marked here in sort of the thicker bold line. Uh, and uh, uh, and this, uh, you, you, if you actually 
take the integrals, the line integrals of the Strebel differential along this critical graph. The one of the things that characterizes the Strebel differential is that these lengths, uh, Strebel lengths, are real, are real and positive with the choice of orientation. And um, the dual of this graph, of this Strebel graph or this critical graph, will be the Feynman graph or the skeleton of the Feynman graph as I was showing over here. So this is the Strebel graph, the one, and these are the disk domains, and these are the double poles of the differential. Uh, and uh, the dual graph is the skeleton graph, which is the skeleton of the original Feynman graph. And these lengths and this treble parameterization of moduli space or the decorated moduli space uh, like this is through these different lengths. And uh, when you sum over all the different topologies of your treble graphs uh, or equivalently of the dual graphs, you're essentially, uh, uh, you get a cell decomposition. You're essentially, these are, uh, the different cells uh, of a very canonical decomposition of this modelized space. Now, the connection with physics is that you should really be thinking of these Strebel lengths as proportional in some way to the number of these weak contractions that you, you had over here. So, the uh, so each length. Uh, that you associate to an edge of the Strebel graph is proportional to the number of uh, weak contractions that sort of cross it or intersect it. And this, uh, I think, is the main uh, point. I think um, so. I have uh, maybe how many minutes uh, do I have, uh, Sridhar? Uh, uh, um, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, okay. 10 uh, minutes. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, so the uh, so now let me say a little bit, uh, very briefly. I think uh, about how uh, um, the tensionless limit and recent work yeah, uh, has sort of given a, um, a, a testing ground for these ideas, and in fact has made them very concrete and explicit. Uh, and this is in the case of ADS-3, CFT-2, and ADS-5, CFT-4, and some of the canonical sort of examples of this in, and we'll work in this tensionless limit. So where you can sort of try to make this connection tautologize it, as I said. So the ADS-3 example, never mind the technicalities, I've just put it here for those who are uh, familiar with these aspects of string theory. It's string theory on an ADS-3 times uh, a three-sphere and a torus and so on, this uh, uh, sort of uh, standard uh, stuff. Um, but it is in a particular highly curved limit, and so it has one unit of flux of a particular kind going through it. And that's sort of a signifier of the fact that it's the smallest curve, uh, curve which I mean, the uh, smallest radius ADS you can have. Um, and uh, the uh, claim and which we uh, made in our papers um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Lawrence Eberhardt and Matthias Gabadia is that this is um, uh, related to a special CFT, what is called an orbifold CFT of uh, the T4 uh, in this particular limit. And uh, we gave a proposal for the world sheet description of this theory, which would uh, describe this dual string, uh, dual CFT. It's also a free theory, as I said. Uh, so that's uh, the re reflection of the fact that it's the coupling is going to zero. And similarly, recently we gave uh, with Matthias a uh, proposal for the tensionless world sheet theory on the original canonical example of ADS CFT, namely that uh, the five dimensional hyperbolic space time times uh, sphere uh, being dual to uh, the maximally supersymmetric yang mills theory. The quite remarkable thing, which I'll just say a little bit about, uh, is that the proposed world sheet theory in both cases also turns out to be free theory, which is very unintuitive because when you normally think of a very highly curved uh, um, a string theory on a highly curved space-time, you think it's a very non-linear sigma model or something like that. Uh, whereas it turns out through some of the miracles of 2D CFT that there is a free field description. Uh, it appears to be 
uh, the right description, we found an extremely non-trivial matching of the entire spectrum of the theory. So you remember uh, the prerequisite was that first you have to make an identification. Uh, it's a non-trivial fact that you can make an identification between this class of operators, uh, the so-called single trace operators here, and uh, uh, the vertex operators of the physical states of the string theory. It has to be a one is to one correspondence. There can't be more on either side. Uh, more or less. So it has to be a direct one is to one correspondence. And this non trivial matching it was one of the strongest evidences in favor of our proposal for the world sheet description. But it's something that is currently being further fleshed out. But in any case, if you take this description, then you can now go from the string theory side to this side and tr then close the circle that I was mentioning earlier, which was going from here to here, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. But now with this world sheet description, you can try to go from here to here and see whether it all closes. And I'll just try to give you a flavor for that in the remaining five minutes. Um, um, so as I said, there's a world sheet theory, which is uh, a free description. And it's in terms of a vesumino witten model, with a super group. Uh, these are the super groups, uh, if you uh, are familiar with the sort of the notation. Uh, these are at level one, so they are the sort of the most highly curved super groups, but there's a free description of them in terms of what turn out to be twister-like variables, uh, which, uh, uh, which I will try to explain in a moment. Um, and so despite them being highly curved, you have a description in terms of certain holomorphic twister variables uh, in the ADS3 case, uh, sort of two twister-like boson variables and uh, supersymmetric fermions. In the ADS5 case, it's four bosons. There's a very important feature of these vesumino witten models, uh, conformal field theories that was needed, and that they have what are called spectrally flowed sectors. These are kind of additional topological-like sectors, uh, which uh, are in correspondence with sectors very, uh, correspond uh, with uh, so-called twisted sectors in this uh, two-dimensional CFT and, sec and sectors of operators with a fixed number of letters in the Yang-Mills theory. And uh, so there's a very refined uh, stratification of the correspondence of the spectrum. Uh, moreover, in the ADS3 case, we have uh, understood the correlators, uh, these kind of correlators in the world sheet theory, uh, and find that they are uh, quite remarkably localized to discrete points on the modelized space. And this is exactly needed to have the kind of correspondence that we have over here, because Feynman graphs, there are a finite number of Feynman graphs in the free theory. And so they can only correspond, if this is to be right, they can only correspond to a fixed number of points on the world sheet. And the kind of correspondence I gave mentioned over here, you get these integer points. These are integers. The number of big contractions is a positive integer. So these are very special points. And indeed, in this particular case, we understand what these points are. These are the points on the modelized space which admit branched coverings from the world sheet, which is two-dimensional, to the space-time which is the boundary of the ADS3, uh, which is also two-dimensional, that is the sphere boundary of ADS3. And you have these solutions which are branched at the points Z1, Z2, Z3 on the world sheet, uh, have a branching and the target space uh, uh, through this, uh, with this branching behavior, ramification uh, W. Um, so, uh, so these branch, uh, these holomorphic coverings of uh, fixed degree are very are discrete, uh, and it's these discrete points that you are picking up. That's what you learn from the analysis on the world sheet, uh, and, in, and so you learn, in fact, that the ADS three world sheet is a sort of a holomorphic covering space of the space time boundary of the ADS three, and uh, this is transparent in this free field limit in terms of these twister like variables. It follows from what is it uh, this fundamental delta function localization uh, to on the modelized space follows from a 
a twister incidence relation. Those who are familiar with twisters will know that uh, there's this uh, Penrose twister incidence relation, which sort of defines twisters. In this case, it's very simple, but it make uh, this is what is responsible for the correlators to uh, localize, and it makes manifest, in fact, the equality of to the two-dimensional CFT correlators. In the ADS-5 case, this twister interpretations is even more compelling because, in fact, all these free bosons and free fermions that I mentioned, they parameterize the twister space of ADS-5, or uh, what is called the ambi-twister space of its boundary, and you have the Penrose-like incidence relation, except now in antidiscita space, there's an extra piece, and uh, we expect these to lead to similar localization to holomorphic covering maps again, but now from the world sheet to twister space. And that's so in four dimensions uh, case, the twister space is really what is playing the role of the target space. Uh, and uh, I, from the field theory point of view, this ties in with the fact which I don't have now time to explain in any detail. But I, I just want to point out one thing that you, you can associate Feynman diagrams with these covering maps. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, you, you find in, in a certain limit that the Schwarzschild of the covering map becomes a kind of Strebel, uh, becomes essentially the Strebel differential, and it has the same structure uh, of uh, the, the Strebel graph comes out exactly in the way that I mentioned earlier. And you get these points on the moduli space with the Strebel lengths are proportional to this integer. So it realizes that correspondence that I mentioned earlier very precisely. And it's obtained through a intermediate mapping to a matrix model and so on, uh, which gives that Strebel differential. Moreover, the integrand on the moduli space also comes out as some kind of an area uh, using this sort of uh, uh, Strebel metric in uh, where the metric is given in terms of the Strebel conformal factor. Uh, and uh, we've uh, recently seen a similar picture holes, at least partially uh, we have seen um, when uh, all the points lie inside an S2 inside the conformal boundary of ADS-5, then you have exactly holomorphic maps. And once again, you can identify the Strebel differential in this case with the Schwarzschild. And quite remarkably, the Strebel area gives rise to the Feynman propagators of the field theory. So from, the, from this uh, prescription, you seem to find a very natural way in which you can get the field theory objects. But now from this Riemann surface point of view uh, uh, with this treble parametrization. Uh, and I don't have the, if that logic was quite involved, it is quite involved. And this is a flow chart, which is meant to kind of uh, show you, this is the field theory side, this is the string theory side, there's an auxiliary matrix model uh, from which you learn about the Schwarzschild and uh, how it's connected to these special points, integer points on the moduli space. So I think I have uh, exceeded my time. Uh, so let me just close with a very brief outlook. Uh, as I try to emphasize, I think uh, the deriving this gate string duality can really uh, overhaul our understanding of quantum field theory and quantum gravity. And um, uh, uh, there are these test cases that I mentioned of tensionless ADS-3 CFT2 and ADS-5 CFT4 are very good cases to see in a very hands-on way how uh, this general program of reassembling large and quantum field theories into string theories, how it can be explicitly carried out. We, could in that case, because of uh, we could propose a tractable world sheet theory. In fact, this free twister world sheet theories, um, you could close the circle, not just from fields to strings, but you could close the circle going back from strings to fields. And this holds out the hope that we can use this program to generalize to large and quantum field theories in general and perturb away from this by using, again, the Feynman diagram expansion. There's many things here to understand better. There's a, one of the fascinating things for me is the way in which these twister world sheet string theories have arisen and uh, the role, the deeper role that 
the twister description seems to play. Uh, there's an underlying topological string description, which I think is responsible for the localization on the modelized space. And uh, this, uh, this whole Strabble dictionary, uh, it uh, I think uh, is uh, crying out for understanding a deeper mathematical underpinnings of gauge string duality and a role for arithmetic, uh, these integer points that I mentioned on modelized space are very closely related to the Gasson the form that I mentioned right at the beginning uh, that Grothendieck was so taken up with. So in any case, that's uh, for the future. And uh, thank you. Oh, uh, this is a sort of a picture I like about how you expect space time to be built up from all these uh, and little bits on the boundary and in fact generate even black holes. Um, so that's in a sense what we are sort of doing here, trying to build up this space time from the field theory through these quantum bits, so to say. But anyhow, thank you for your attention. Uh, th thank you, Rajesh, uh, for a uh... As usual, very lucid talk on a very complicated uh, subject. If there are any questions, we can take them. There is one question she there by Shyam. Shyam, you can just unmute. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, hello, Rajesh. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I went, I listened to all of it and uh, actually have some questions. <laughs> sure. I'm yeah. happy about for myself. I, uh, I have a few questions. Uh, some questions are for uh, my clarification. Uh, in the general uh, uh, equivalence between the two theories, the field theory side and the string theory, on the field theory side, your quantum field theory defined on some manifold. Those points are denoted by x1, x2, etc. Right? Now, on the string theory side, the same manifold becomes a uh, 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 target space for the string theory. No, it's the boundary of the target space. It's the conformal oh, boundary. X1, X2 are the same points. No? On the both sides, you're computing correlation function. No. Functions of the same no, argument. That's a good point. So uh, that's right. So this side, the labels, as you said, uh, they, they label some boundary. In this yeah. case, simplest case, I've taken a d-dimensional sphere. Uh, now, it's interesting because these are actually on-shell correlators of the uh, closed string side. These are off-shell correlators of the field theory, but the ADS safety dictionary relates off-shell correlators of this uh, field theory to on-shell scattering amplitudes of the string theory. Now the on-shell scattering amplitudes of the string theory are actually labeled by, can be labeled by just the positions on the boundary because they, that's effectively where in a sense, you can think of them as infinity, and uh, uh, and then um, they they are uh, so when the vertex operators are really going to infinity. So you can label the uh, string amplitudes. You should think of this as some kind of a scattering amplitude where the string in states are at positions x one, x two, x n on the boundary, and then they are coming in and scattering. But so, I can then take the bulk to be any manifold with a given boundary. The bulk is a manifold. No, the bulk is the antidecitor space time. Oh, it's specifically boundary. only that. Is it? It's not more general. I mean, so this is the case that we are mostly working with here, uh, where you have uh, the exactly antidecitor space time in the bulk yeah. and um, uh, and uh, the string theory and the uh, conformal boundary uh, in the bulk. But this can be generalized in ADSC. Uh, I mean, you can consider either by perturbations or so on uh, up to asymptotically antidecitor space times and so on. And in which case, of course, you those you would treat as uh, uh, as when the field theory is no longer conformal. So when the field theory is no longer conformal, you'll have to consider uh, backgrounds which are maybe asymptotically antidecitor and not exactly antidecitor. Uh, and if you consider the full quantum string theory, you'll have to sum over all geometries, which we are not doing at the moment because we are only looking at the uh, perturbative string theory. So from the string theory point of view, we are only looking at the um, excitations around the antidecitor vacuum.
Okay, so that's a particular solution of the beta function equal to zero equation, right? Yeah, the uh, antidecitor space time is the maximally symmetric. Uh, that's the maximally symmetric solution. Okay. Now, uh, another more general question uh, if I just look at this right hand side just simply as uh, functions defined on the manifold with certain set of points, yes, uh, to be computed by some procedure, yeah. and if that is a gravitational theory, how do I understand the full diffeomorphism of uh, this? Quantities I calculate on the right hand side. So uh, the uh, so let me um, the function of n points and I can change the points. Yeah. Right. How do I understand that? Uh, uh, yeah. So these are on the conformal boundary. You uh, you I mean, so diffeomorphisms will act in the usual way in the sense that you can of course. Uh, act uh, so there'll be residual diffeomorphisms. Diffeomorphisms in the boundary uh, in the bulk you will not see because these are uh, the, that's what the string theory computes for you. The, uh, the these will be functions on the of the manifold on the boundary. The points on the boundary the only. Diffeomorphism will act in the usual on way. The boundary. It'll be just covariant under that uh, uh, diffeomorphism. Okay, anyway, it's a particular solution, so it wouldn't make much sense to transform it to something else. Right? And you can have a particular solution about which you can. Uh, uh, diffeomorphisms, of course, are gauge symmetry, so you can consider any diffeomorphisms. That is built in into the, uh, the state because diffeomorphisms do not change the background, uh, they just uh, re parameterize it. Okay, I think for the moment that is uh, all. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Rito, Rito has a question. So the thing that you showed that where the moduli space is like a sum over delta function on the on some points on the moduli space, that is yes. only twin this tensionless limit. That, that is a, uh, uh, a, it's uh, likely to happen only at the tensionless limit. Uh, when you perturb away from the tensionless limit on both sides, you know that you will not, no longer be localized on it because uh, on the string theory side, uh, yes, uh, the world sheet theory is no longer free theory and you will not get this very special delta function localization. On the uh, quantum field theory side also, now you have to sum over graphs. Feynman graphs, uh, and uh, you uh, when you uh, do that, now uh, at the moment you turn on an infinitesimal coupling also, you have an infinite number of Feynman graphs to sum over. Uh, right. You're not truncating at any order in the diagram, in the Feynman diagram expansion. So then you effectively will be seeing the whole moduli space. Uh, so, so both sides, uh, yeah, this is the free point is very special and that what that's what makes it a very convenient point to expand around because it's sort of very simple in some ways and that's why it's almost topological in some ways. So, uh, but you have to sum over all possible uh, Riemann surfaces, right? Like, like the you'll, have to, and... you'll have an integral over the Riemann surface like over here. You'll have a bona fide, right now, the integrand has support only on special points on the Riemann surface, but in general, it will be something that will have a support all over the modular space. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Alok, nothing in the chat? No, nothing in the chat, uh, Shudesh. OK, so shall we uh, close uh, thank, uh, thanking uh, Rajesh for a wonderful talk? Great. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Rajesh. Wonderful. Thanks. And yeah, thank I look you. forward to thank you. Rajesh. yours. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, all the best thank uh, you. for the center. And uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we will bug you about that. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rajesh. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye, bye. Yeah. Bye, so bye. So remember bye. tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow there are two talks. Don't forget <laughs> one at two o'clock and one at night at nine o'clock. See you tomorrow. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.